Well, first of all, thank you all so much for coming here today. I, I promise this is this might be one of the better talks. Maybe, I don't know. It's, it's up to you guys to tell me that. And so uh, you'll have to forgive me if I'm actually asking you to rate now, and then I'll ask you again at the end. But uh, um, has everybody rated the other talks that they've been to? Yes? No? Ooh. Well, we're going to start rating our attendees. So, <laughs> yeah, so it's only fair. Uh, but, um, so. This is web performance in 2017. Um, uh, first, before I go uh, in, into the discussion, I, I, uh, I, I want to say a, a super a big <coughs> thanks to the DrupalCon team. Right? They just they've done an amazing job. They they do a great job every year, and uh, it's it's really amazing what uh, how this really works out for us. You know, to all get together and congregate, and meet each other, and um, you know, learn more about Drupal and uh, what e each other are doing. But and once again, you know, really a big thanks to you, the, the people that are really attending the conference and coming out and making this uh, possible. Three thousand people plus—that's no small feat. And also, thanks for coming to this. I know that it's almost a wrap. I know it's after lunch, you know, and I know that it can often be a snoozer. So I'm going to try my best to make that not the case this time around. So. Please note a couple of things real quick. Uh, that uh, you know, I, I, this session kind of assumes familiarity with performance and you know making performance a priority in your work. Um, you know I, I'm going to be speaking as if you know you're already into this stuff. So you know, forgive me if this isn't like really kind of like a novice type of uh, talk. Um, you know it is marked as advanced, and uh, you know I I will probably speak about things in a very casual way in terms of technology and so if. Uh, if it doesn't make any sense, please feel free to ask a question or for clarification at any, at any point. Also, this session is not exhaustive. Uh, I only have an hour, right? Um, I'm not going to try to talk about everything. I'm, I just want to talk about the things that, that I think are, are really interesting and, you know, and, and really relevant to performance today uh, in terms of uh, you know, uh, the, the, the main topics that we'll cover here in a moment. Uh, so here's the plan. I'm going to talk about really kind of four sections, right? First thing is I really want to talk about measurement and the, the, you know, the activity of measurement. Uh, next, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, networking and, and how it relates to uh, performance. I think that we'll find that uh, the, the, you know, the majority of, of performance in the web, I, I find, is, is really at the, uh, comes down to networking and then you know, everything else after that. Uh, we'll, we'll cover uh, aspects of UI and so for more of like the, the front end engineers and the, those, those different concerns that you have. And then after that, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, code and, and the uh, impacts and performance, stuff like that. Um, I, I, I do want to have uh, time for Q&A after each section. I, I don't want to wait until the very end. If you've got a question to ask me about measurement, let's talk about it when we're talking about measurement. I don't want to make you wait to the end. And so um, and that's really the plan. Is that, is that cool? Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. OK. Measurement. So measurement, in my mind, is performance. You can't tell if your website is performant if you're not measuring it. Does it make sense? And so that's, I think that's the, the real, when everybody, anybody actually is going to get into performance, that's the first thing you're going to do is they're going to find ways of measuring it. They're going to start learning about tooling, and they're going to start getting a benchmark of kind of like where they're at. And so the big one. Everybody is a web page uh, test. Is every, uh, anybody use this before? Show of hands. All right. See, this is what I'm talking about. I assumed you already knew about it. And so it is absolutely free and it is awesome. And I was running it on Drupal.org last night. And some of the slides really kind of include some of that information. Um, in fact, they got an amazing, come on, you got to clap for that. Look at that. That's A. Yeah. So they're, they're doing a good job at it, right? Those, those association dollars are paying off, OK? <laughs> um, you, know, for, for, you know, just to talk a little bit more about the tool, it, it, does, it has the killer waterfall. And I think that uh, those are, those, we're going to talk a little bit about it. But I mean, that's one of the really the, 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 the best features that I want to point out that you really need to, to, to know well when it comes to performance. Uh, the recording is amazing. And I, you know, it's really good to be able to see what's going on. And I, I want to point out that some of the key metrics behind uh, you know, your results are actually related to the recordings and when you get through the transition between the white page and then the actual rendered content. Um, web page test has a very handy API. 
And uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how that, that API can be leveraged uh, you know, for your kind of like long-term strategy related to performance. But first I wanna talk about some of the, you know, really kind of talk about the key metrics. So the speed index, everybody familiar with the speed index? And uh, no? Well, it's, it's a calculated metric. Uh, it's mostly voodoo, right? Um, but uh, the, the, the real goal is that you wanna target less than a, a 1,000. And um, that's actually kind of tough to do, frankly. I, have, I haven't seen very few sites actually achieve it, or, or at least a consistently over a series of runs. Uh, the first paint itself is reported by the browser, which, so was, which is interesting because it's, we're actually having to jack into the browser itself and uh, to determine when it, when it says that it's actually uh, doing the painting, it seems logical, but um, that metric is, is important because you've also got the start render metric, which once again is, is really based on content actually showing when it comes to the measurement tool itself. Um, you know, we've got the uh, visually complete, the end render, uh, which we would call it, and that's just uh, when everything, all of the DOM is, is parsed, everything is loaded, and it assumes that everything has actually been, been rendered, in particular the uh, below the fold content. And then there's, of course, the, the document complete uh, metrics, DOM loaded, uh, for, you know, for, especially for the JavaScript crowd, you know, you're, you're pretty familiar with what this is, so. And then, of course, there's the fully loaded metrics, which I, I think are really important because, you know, your page might load, and all, everything that you intended to load is good, but then if you're doing any kind of digital analytics or you're doing any kind of uh, third-party tagging, that's part of the fully loaded metric, and so you might have this blazing fast sub-second page that loads instantly, but then three or four seconds go by for it actually to be fully loaded, and so that's, that's, that's part of it, and, and most of the time, the manifestation of fully loaded is gonna be the little rotating wheel up on your tab, and so uh, does anybody have that, see that on websites? It looks like the website's loaded, but it's just churning. That's what that is, and it's usually everybody else's fault. Okay, so, and, and, we'll, and we'll, we'll see how that's even happening on uh, Drupal.org is a good example, so. Um, there is a full you know, um, explanation of all the various metrics and kind of uh, how stuff, are, for instance, how the speed index is calculated and other things that are available there for their documentation. So, highly recommend that you take a look. Now, yes, I've plugged web page tests. I don't work for them, but it's great, right? And the point is that, that m metrics can be monitored. Okay, and the monitoring uh, can be automated. And in this case, that would lead to a performance budget. And so, has anybody here heard of a performance budget before? Yeah, a couple of hands. Who's actually got a performance budget? Yeah, uh, cool, excellent, yes. Well then, so we came to the right talk. So, the performance budget, it's, you know, you set these constraints, and then you get alerting. You get something to tell you, hey, you know, let's say the number of items that you want on a page can be a constraint, the, the actual uh, you know, DOM loaded time, right? Uh, it, it, all kinds of different metrics and being able to go and set that criteria and then to be aware of when that criteria is violated uh, is just extremely helpful, especially for the long-term performance impacts, right? Um, a lot of times uh, we just do a lot of work on our websites and we don't know what the impacts are, what things might make sense and look really good, and especially with the new technologies, but we don't know what kind of impacts we're actually bringing down on our, on our site. So, you know, there's a ton of different options you can do. Of course, you can set up a private instance and with some good automation of, of web page test. Don't necessarily recommend that unless you've got, you know, the time and the, uh, the, the dedication to it, but, uh, you know, you've also got other things that, this comes back to the API of web page test. So there are tools, mostly NPM packages, that will leverage that API to, you know, run tests, report back the metrics, and then actually, you know, compare it against the thresholds that you set as a configuration of that package. Uh, that stuff's great, especially for the JavaScript folks, but uh, I, I can't really say exactly how that would fit into the, the Drupal ecosystem per se. Uh, you know, your mileage may vary. Uh, you have the services. Right, you know, you've got Web Performance and Dynatrace, and there's just there's all kinds of services out there that you can get, and uh, some of them will even do things like compare you against other uh, web pages and see how you stack up in your industry, which is which is pretty cool. And then um, you know, there's definitely a lot more that I'm leaving out, right? And so there's uh, the, 
It, there's just so much out there in terms of the performance budget. As long as, you know, it really comes down to, you know, you, your attitude. You know, if, you, if you're dedicated to performance and you want to make sure that you stay performant, a performance budget is really kind of, you know, a must-have. And um, I, I really recommend that you read all about this topic. There's just so much out there about how to do it, uh, especially from a lot of people uh, in, that are well-known in the Drupal community. And so I uh, highly recommend you take a look at it. Um, now, now, now there is, you know, of course, web page test, and there's things like uh, page speed inside, stuff like that. But um, I highly recommend that uh, if you're just in your browser and you're in Chrome, you can look at something called the audits. And it will, you can run it on like a, a fresh load state, or you can actually run it when you're on your, you know, uh, when you're actually loading a page or a fresh load. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to run it right now because I don't, I learned my lesson on uh, live demos, okay? Especially on con internet, mm -mm, not going to happen, sorry. So, but if there's a couple of cool things, if you want some like gotchas, want some like meat, this one's really fascinating right here, this remove unused CSS rules. What's cool about this is this will, if you unconsolidate it, it will actually expose all of the selectors that are not being used and it will aid you in identifying what's not being used, which is actually kind of tough because you, know, you can't know until you actually render your elements. And if you're including something like, like Bootstrap or Foundation or any kind of library, you, know, you just get it, it's just coming in. Right? So that's one of the, the, the great things in terms of the tools. And uh, as far as uh, D8 is concerned, um, I am working on a sandbox module for running performance budgets but using different plugins. And uh, that way it can actually be inside of your ecosystem. The idea is that it would run on cron based on a configuration you would set. It would, you know, you give it URL or multiple URLs. It will actually run it against the criteria you set in the CMS and then it can jack into something like the status page and status report. And so you can get an alert, hey, you know, something's going on. And I think that's uh, surfacing it inside of your site I think would be good. Um, having it external is better than having nothing, granted, but trying to get as many eyes on the site in, in question, I think, is really kind of the goal. And so if I can make it a turnkey module you just install, hey, there you go, right? And so that's really kind of the goal. Contributions are accepted. So questions for measurement? Anybody? Come on, there's just too many people here not to be any questions. Come on. No? Oh, yeah, please. Yeah, it's okay. So a lot of times when working with clients, you know, they want the site to be performant. And we say, and obviously what you can do depends on a lot of different constraints that may be out of your control. Sure. So um, what recommendations do you have for saying, okay, this is the target that we are shooting for that is understandable to a not necessarily technical user? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, so the, the, uh, to repeat, just to make sure I understand, how, how do you convey um, some kind of uh, metrics or some kind of uh, target to a non-technical person? Um, I don't work for an agency, so I haven't, uh, had for in a long time, and so I haven't had to interact with clients in a while, so I'm not, you know, <laughs> forgive me if that's a weak muscle, but um, I would do I would just try as hard as I could and tr to convey it and tell them that, you know, most people can understand that, hey, uh, say for instance, most mobile users will leave after three seconds, right? Or, or some, the, the, the real popular metrics about, you know, why a fast loading uh, site, would, you know, uh, it, it is meaningful. And I would convey that to them and then I would try to, you know, use those metrics to kind of say like, you know, we're shooting for three seconds. We want to keep you inside of what the industry says is, you know, the, the good confines, and, and then that way, the, if you need to spend more time doing development to achieve those things, then at least you can have those, uh, yeah, yeah, you get it, okay. Uh, any more, any, any more? No? Okay, this talk's gonna go pretty fast, <laughs> so. Okay, so next. We're gonna talk a little bit more about uh, networking uh, related to performance, uh, particularly about HTTP and you know, browser technology in and of itself. Um, first, HTTP2. Who's, who's got HTTP2 ready to rock? A couple. Yeah, so uh, have, you know what, and probably more of you, but you may not actually realize it. So who's hosting on, say, like, Acquia? Yeah, you've got it. 
who's, who's uh, behind, especially if you're behind Akamai, who's on uh, Pantheon. Yep, you've got it too. And so that's one of the, be the, the, the neat things about HTTP is that uh, you don't even know it. It's completely transparent to you, yet it, those things heavily factor the performance of your website or your sites or your applications. Uh, so in particular, what is it? Now that you know, uh, we've introduced it, it is binary instead of textual. So we are transmitting you know, just bytes, not just, you know, um, not just the bytes that represent the text, but the actual just raw bytes, which is easier. It's, it's easier to parse. It's a lot more compact over the wire. Uh, the connections are fully multiplexed, and so that means that you open one connection to an origin of some kind, and you can download multiple items in parallel instead of like a sequence of connections, which is really nice. That way, you know, uh, those, the, when those uh, things are downloaded in parallel, it just it makes a lot more sense, and uh, the waterfall is compact as well. Um, header compression, which is, in my mind, probably the biggest feature, uh, because, you know, headers describe the document and really control your page, especially from the browser's perspective. And so in this case, the compression itself is nice because it, 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 otherwise it would just be raw text, this block of text, even including things like new lines and all that. And, you know, the, it's, it's not all that efficient. So now they've actually made a, a dedicated compression mechanism to compress those headers and then everything goes over the wire, wire real nicely. Uh, and, and then lastly is a support for, for so server pushes, right, which is, you know, I, I think we're all starting to get a little bit more comfortable with push technology, especially on our mobile devices and, and native applications. Um, the, the real goals are about uh, informing the browser of things that would probably be relevant, you know, it's worth caching or worth preloading in some way in, in the background so that, uh, um, you know, the next click or whatever is going to be instantly loaded. But it is somewhat experimental, and the good practices have not really been identified because most people aren't even aware that they're on HTTP2, let alone taking advantage of it. Uh, server pushes could probably be problematic, uh, especially if you get very aggressive with like, hey, you know, you really need this, 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 and, this, and then at that point, you're really clogging the lines on your own, right? And so it's, it, that's going to kind of evolve over time, and uh, with with things like uh, like Big Pipe and you know platforms like Drupal, I think that you're going to see a lot of things done to kind of make it a little bit more of a turnkey, out of the box, optimized option. Uh, next, I want to talk a little bit more about those uh, those headers, especially when it comes uh, to, to caching, right? and so. You know, once again, it does describe the document. It tells you what its content type is. It tells you what its length is. But it all, all, headers are also, you know, um, where the cache control itself is. And, and, and cache control is huge, especially when it comes to, to performance, right? Because you, you want to cache as much as possible. You want to tell that browser, you know, this content is good for how long and give it an idea of, uh, you know, how to avoid those network round trips. Um, just as a brief aside, has anybody in here heard of the notion of an offline first experience? Yes? Awesome. I, I'm loving that the more important pe people are knowing that. Cache control is critical to this idea of making your website load once and actually run in an offline fashion, right, in some kind of like a, a reduced experience. And so these things like cache control are going to be critical. In addition, it's going to be the very header which uh, for systems like Akamai, for instance, if you've got a very header and it's got certain values in it, it will refuse to cache that request because it, it's, it's variable, particularly around, say, like a cookie or a user agent. It will, it will know that, hey, I'm only supposed to cache this response for a desktop browser or, or only under certain circumstances like a, a response could be JSON, right, or a response could be HTML depending on encoding type. And so that, that header is pretty, pretty important to, to, um, to understand and be aware of and to inspect as you guys are, are developing. Uh, next is going to be the e-tag. Now, it's extremely cryptic what e-tag is, but it's really related to identifying uniqueness when uh, the browser is going to make a simple check to say, hey, like, has, has content for this changed? Especially, regardless of how long your TTL is, it's still going, the browser still want to make a connection out and they want to say, hey, has, has, has this changed? They're just going to cha check a couple of headers to see uh, if anything has changed. And e-tag is one of those items. Um, 
if you have a server farm or more than one server, I want to point out that eTag is very tricky because it's unique per server. And so um, it can vary between machines. And so if you're not, you know, you want to try to serve from, from your cache. Uh, hopefully you have some kind of edge cache where you can help like, normalize that value. Otherwise, it, you can be prone to getting new requests. Uh, next is cookies, okay? And I think we all know uh, about the load of cookies, especially when there's a ton of cookies and it is blowing up the size of your headers, right? And so that's where HPAC comes in, right? So it's where some of this other technology comes in to help. But, you know, I think it's very important to know uh, what's going on with your cookies and to be very uh, aware of how that's affecting performance, especially from a, a caching perspective. And then lastly is going to be uh, the link uh, header itself. Now, uh, the link header and the link tag are essentially the same thing. But uh, where I want to point it out in terms of headers is that, uh, you know, out of the box, Drupal will give you a short link and it'll give you the canonical URL and pre-populates the link header for you. But uh, there's a couple of other very important uh, values, namely something like pre-connect or prefetch, DNS prefetch, where you can instruct the browser through headers to start obtaining different uh, items or different resources in advance or to start to establishing those you know, connections right now uh, in anticipation of other items loading in the future. And so it, it, that, that one's really pretty critical. There's plenty of explanation about this on, uh, on the Mozilla network. But, uh, I highly recommend you take a close look at that stuff. Uh, next is really, comes down to, to waterfall optimization. And, and it's important that you know your waterfall, okay, guys? Um, it, it, you know, there's a, a couple of important techniques that I want to talk a little bit about. Um, one of the things that Drupal is really good about is you don't see any third-party URLs at the top, right? They're really prioritizing that single connection, especially from HTTP2's perspective, right? And you just see this like, whoosh, everything comes down. And you're prioritizing your downloads instead of say, if you have images on a CDN or something like that, that has a different URL, you don't want to uh, mix it in here, right? You want to try to maximize that initial load and then defer uh, connecting to other origins a little bit later. I think it's important that you understand in the, the waterfall the impacts of things like DNS and SSL, right, which would be these, these little bars right here. A, a lot of times, SSL itself can you know, take 100 milliseconds or more, 200 milliseconds. And, you know, that's just something that you kind of have no control over, right? But, you know, if, you're, if your goal is to get a sub-second load and your SSL is taking 200 milliseconds, then that's really... That's a 20% reduction you have no control over. And we haven't even gotten into things like the connection or, or DNS for that matter. Um, I think it's important to understand the, the, the differences between HTTP2 and HTTP1 in terms of the waterfall. And I think that when you, when you look at this, it, this is a, a really interesting example of how everything starts really at the same time. And it's pulling in and that, that parallel behavior, if you look at more more common waterfalls, especially with the previous version of HTTP, it, it, it tends to get staggered and, and, and not be quite as linear in this regard right here. And so uh, but, you know, as you start to work on this, just really start to get an understanding of like, kind of like how the, how, what that stuff looks like and, and, and do comparisons. There's lots of examples out there that will demonstrate what you can expect in that regard. And so I, I recommend that you look for that. Um, I think it's important to understand the impacts of a uh, resource hence themselves. I mentioned like a pre-connect where um, you can't really see that in this example here. Here, let me jump out and see if I can actually pull one. Here we go. So in this regard, you'll notice that this Google Analytics, or I'm sorry, this double click item right here, you've got the connection, but then you've got this big breakout here, and that's because on Drupal.org they've given a, a hint to pre-connect to that resource as a result of this response up here directly from Drupal.org. They, they've done it inside of a link tag and said, hey, pre-connect to this guy down here. And that way, when it, it's, the connection's already established and done, and then when it's ready to be loaded, or the actual uh, uh, items considered in the DOM, boom, it'll hit it. Um, you can see where uh, we've got other items over here. Imagine if 
all of these were moved over here. You can see how like this request is forcing everything over here to the right. And so a pre-connect would effectively shift everything to the left. And that's why this four second fully loaded time could be improved by just simply indicating a couple of hints, right, to just overcome that. And, in, and for Drupal.org's uh, perspective, there's a couple of hints, but they're not necessarily hinting everything. And so there's, there could be some optimizations made there. And, and um, actually, I'm, I'm going to go back to this just for a second here. Uh, the the, the third-party drag. I mean, Drupal.org is done right here, you know? Basically about 1.1 seconds, right? But what's all this, <laughs> right? It's not Drupal.org. It's pixel geo perfect. It's pixel perfect stuff, right? It's, it's all these other third parties. And, you know, Digital advertising is a fact of life if you want to get visibility online, right? But what are the impacts of that, right? It's, you know, you hope you're making more money, but if you can directly link your web performance to your return on investment, but they're dragging you down, right? It's, it's, these are the things that, you know, are, are important to know, and this is where the budget comes into play, because if you've got the budget pre-established before you enter into some kind of contractual agreement, then if it violates it, you'll know. Or if you're in the actual uh, you know, proof of concept or the initial integration phase, you'll have a clear understanding of how you know, this additional resource is making things, uh, you know, it, it's dragging on your website. And so I think it's important that you understand the nuances of, of third-party drag, uh, especially if you've optimized it in a way where you know, you're expecting everything to be loaded up front real quickly. Uh, there's a ton of guidance online for optimizing the waterfall and explaining every aspect of this much better than I can. And um, I, I, I highly recommend you do some searches for this because that, that waterfall is, is, is really a, a great visual tool to understand uh, where the bottlenecks are, where things could be improved, and um, you know, kind of the state of, uh, state of things. So uh, you don't have to only use web page tests. We've got the waterfall itself built into uh, the Chrome tab, and then you know you can get an idea of how things look over time. This one is particularly interesting because you'll notice that the timeline is actually extending past four seconds, right, and going into the, the five and six and seven seconds, which is which is odd because it just goes to show that there's there's tags, there's different things that are being loaded, and then it's doing more activity and making subsequent requests, which is actually affecting the overall uh, network, uh, you know connection stack, and so it's, it's interesting. If you actually just leave the network tab open, does it keep growing or does it stay fixed, right? And how does that affect performance if you're just continuing to connect, make connections in the background, you know, uh, especially for if, they're, if they're blocking types of requests, so. D8 highlights for networking. I'm plugging my own module again. But this is the resource hence module, uh, and it is a, a module I've got. A, it's an alpha for D8. It's, it's already available in, uh, for D7, and it allows you to specify the different kinds of resource hence that you want. It supports most of the major ones, DNS prefetch, pre-connect, prefetching, pre-rendering. Pre-render is really cool. If you can anticipate, if you know that you're trying to, to drive people, like from a landing page to another page, you can pre-render a whole other web page in the background and then if they actually do navigate to that page, it loads instantly. So I've got that, this module here to help uh, support that. Um, contributions are welcome, once again. So Q&A for networking. So server push. Yes. How's that going to affect measurement and what it looks like for document complete or page complete? as well as for waterfall. That's a great point. So I don't, I don't think that they would actually factor into the, the waterfall itself because that's like a, you know, you're actually telling the server to make that subsequent connection. Now, um, I haven't seen it demonstrate, I haven't seen the actual push behavior itself demonstrated on a live site to see what that would look like, but I would suspect it's probably something not too dissimilar from what I was showing about how um, subsequent requests are being made from resources that are loaded. Right? And so it would presumably be something kind of similar to that where it just is making a push. But I'd have to see what that looks like. Um, now, in terms of measurement, I, I think that that's, 
That's a great question to, to ask. Um, I, I'm, honestly, I haven't do dove that, that deep into that particular technology, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's something to be considered, no doubt about it. Um, I think it kind of comes back to the best practices still being kind of to be determined, but uh, hopefully uh, you'll find out and tell me, right? Got it. Okay. Yes. Hi. Uh, so with the third-party origins, do some of these tools for monitoring actually consider the probability that a user agent already has this from some other site? Because I guess that's the idea with, say, using jQuery CDN versus running it through your own origin. Um, um, okay, so to uh, repeat the question, uh, do, do the uh, third parties, uh, do they leverage the same kind of technology or, or are you talking about more like anticipation of? of yeah. yeah, well, so I guess if you want to decide whether to serve a library through your own origin, or use a third party CDN, which would, you know, be a, a maybe a blocking, you know, would wait totally a little bit longer on that kind of waterfall, but maybe the uh, user agent already has it from a different site. Yeah, that, that's that's a that's a great uh, that's a great question. Yeah, so um, uh, just to repeat it completely, yeah, did you choose to load it from your origin, or do you use a third party origin because of some uh, something that they've already got, or in some cases, may the browser already even have it preloaded? Like my understanding is that jQuery is going to be included in Chrome soon. And so you would never even load it. It would always be available, right? Um, mm -hmm. Well, in my opinion, you want to load every, you want to try to control as much as you can, as, especially because of how you may or may not bundle your requests together, right? Like if you're going to concatenate everything together in one like massive JavaScript bundle or not. Um, also, if you're going to be using uh, like an origin pull CDN like, like Akamai, you're going to, you're, you're, if, you're, if all of your resources are coming from the closest node, you want all of your resources to come from the closest node. And so, um, you know, it really just kind of depends on, on your use case. But I would favor um, having control over it because what happens if they go down? Or what if they're not, what if they've got very heavy cookies? Or what if they've got something, or headers? You know, what if they're not um, as dedicated to performance as you are? So, Thanks. does that answer your question? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, any, any more questions? How's, uh, how's it going so far? You guys need a break? Huh? <laughs> okay, great. Um, so, next up. Oh, please. Oh, uh, yeah, please. That would be excellent. Yes. I'm use sign language, so I'm going to use the interpreter to voice for me. Good Thank afternoon, you. everyone. Um, I noticed that there are several apps, websites having different approaches. Some use internal libraries and some use third-party libraries. For example, Bootstrap or jQuery, CK Editor. So there are several libraries and there are options to use internal libraries or third-party libraries. So what is your recommendation on that for top optimization? Um, uh, okay, thank you for the question. Um, I, I, I feel like that question is very similar to the previous question. Is that, is that fair? Um, when's a good time to go third-party? You know, um, I would say that it mostly comes down to how you're hosting your site. If you're really relying on, um, let's say, a static site that's out on like a hosted CDN and you, and you don't necessarily have a lot of control, then, then third parties might give you some distinct adva advantages. Um, but I, you know, in terms of CK editor, and not to be completely pedantic, but CK editor is just going to be slow and impactful anyway, right? So there's nothing you can do. Okay, um, and same for jQuery for that matter, okay? And Bootstrap. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, but, uh, yeah. So, okay, so let's say that I have a, lar a big pipe, meaning it's better to use an internal library. But if I use something like shared hosting, then it's better to use third party because there's better um, file, you know, because of the file size. That, that, that could be part of it. It also, I would also say that to consider that your bandwidth costs might be something to be considered as well. If, um, that, that, if it is 
being loaded from a third party um, endpoint, you're not paying for that bandwidth, the, the client's just connecting. And so, you know. Oh, um, uh, yeah. I, there you go. Yeah. There you go. I'd, I'd, yes, I'd love to say there's a best practice, but I, I think you're, it just kind of is a conditional thing. Okay, excellent question. Thank you. Okay, any, any more? All right, all right, moving along. All right, so DUI, so HTML, CSS. Everybody's best friends, right? All right, so who has less than 10,000 lines of CSS? Huh? Yeah? Awesome, there it is. Yeah, so uh, you should talk to them after the talk. <laughs> but, um, you know, those, uh, th that stuff is seriously important, especially when it comes to paint, right? I mean, think about how many different considerations and traversals of the DOM it has to go over when it's interpreting every single rule and you've just got thousands of rules, right? I mean, and so that's, that brings me straight to the idea of the critical render path. And so who's, who's heard of the critical render path? A few of us, excellent. All right, so who really pays attention to the critical render path? <laughs> excellent, excellent. A few of us, but that's important because it, it's it's a very nuanced approach to, to front end development that is that is taking performance, you know, and putting it front and, and center. Uh, so you know, it's the steps that browsers must take to convert your resources into a usable site. Okay, and there is a ton of information out there, especially from Google, on how to really optimize that critical render path. But um, you know, just to talk about it here. I think, it's, I think it's important that you do understand your resources and how they're affecting rendering and or loading, right? If something is render blocking, then it is blocking your path, right? And that, that render blocking resources, those, are, those tend to be very easy to add to your site, okay? I mean, you know, and you don't even realize you're doing it. Um, I think it's also important to understand the waterfall, right, and, and the order of loading. Uh, you know, I, I had demonstrated how, how, how Drupal.org pushes everything to the, of theirs to the top of that waterfall. And they're really trying to optimize that aspect of their path by not letting third party connections interfere with the, 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 prog the progress of their loading. I mean, if you've, you know, you need some other piece of CSS that has not been loaded or some other piece of uh, a JavaScript, but yet you're waiting for a third party, you know, request, it's, you know, that's, it's important to understand that they could be affecting your, you know, your rendering. Um, it's, I think it's, it's, it goes without saying, but I mean, you know, really understanding how to minimize your resources is, is key, right? I mean, that, if you've just got 10 different resources or more loading, right, then that path becomes a, a difficult, right? I mean, imagine it on a map. I mean, what's the shortest distance between two points, right? You know what I'm saying? And versus this, this crazy line, you know? And, and so I think that r really understanding that uh, how uh, you can minimize the different uh, aspects, and, and aggregation is not necessarily minimizing the number of resources, right? Just, it just means that you're getting a really big one at some point, right? Um, but also minimizing the number of round trips, you know, if you can, if you can load something instantly, you can, you know, and then not uh, do re-requests, especially from, from like, you know, optimizing things like your headers, right, and really reducing those round trips, and the, then the path becomes clearer. Um, there is a really great uh, article, uh, once again, from the Google folks that really talks about how to optimize uh, and the philosophies, and they demonstrate uh, some of the tooling. Uh, but uh, next thing I want to talk about a little bit more is the fonts, right? You know, and, and, and fonts are the bane of performance, okay? And, it's, and everybody has to have five of them, right? Okay, and, you know, and, they're, and they're pretty, right? And, I, and I'm, I'm all for a, a killer presentation, but what do you do with fonts, right? Once you've got them, they're just, they're just kind of on your website. Now the entire look is dictated by these fonts, right? You don't know how big they are. You don't know how many characters you're not using. You know, are you using the internationalized version or not? What about kerning? Okay, kerning, right? <laughs> right. If it's got that information, but you're not adjusting kerning in CSS, then then is you know that's just more to load, especially on something like a phone, right? If a phone has to load this huge font just for to be able to see the site, you know. Um, there are too many formats, in, in my opinion. You know, um, you know, you've got WAF, WAF two, EOT, TTF, right? You, you know, that's the other question, right? 
especially if you're in the business of manufacturing web fonts, right? That's just lovely, okay, you know? <laughs> um, you know, and, and Google Fonts really tries to help on this by sensing which user agent they're on, even looking at things like their connections and trying to send just the font itself that, you know, should, you know, the actual file, the format, um, and in some cases even the, the, the CDN uh, endpoint. And so, you know, it, Google Fonts is, is great to, to assist in that regard, but then again, you're relying on that third party again. And then um, uh, for any of you that have implemented it, you also have to start taking cross-origin request, you know, s security settings into play. And so then, you're, you know, when you can't load a font without taking security into consideration, then, you know, what the heck, right? So um, th another point I want to point out is that, you know, EOT and TTF, which tends to be the, the preference for older browsers, you know, they don't, they don't come compressed. And so it, it's up to you to figure out how to compress it, which means that you probably have to host it. Right, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but you know, it, it's just one more resource that is going to be added to the stack, right? And so, it's, it, I think it's very important to, to point that out. Um, font redraws. Um, I think everybody here has seen like uh, you know a regular ugly font and then a really pretty font all of a sudden, right? And you get that funky flash and that transition, and I just you know. That demonstrates that the site has loaded and then it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. And so it's hard to gauge your performance when things are happening after the fact, right? And so it's, it's a little funny there. Um, sorry if it sounds like I hate fonts. I don't. But they're, they're you know, it's a font and it's, a, it's crazy just what a typography will do to your website. Um, you know, and then fonts, you know, it does. It always blocks because it always has to render and it absolutely affects your CSS object model, and it does cause those redraws every single time. And you know, even if it's already rendered, it's going to do it again. And then it has to take those fonts into consideration for every selector, especially if you've got any kind of type of you know, um, you know text-related settings. And so uh, there are um, there is salvation, you know, with uh, web font optimization. And I think that looking into these different criteria is something that you might want to do. Um, but uh, it's Fonts are kind of a, a way of life, and so um, you know, try to, to uh, uh, take them uh, into consideration as you're adding them in. Uh, next, I want to talk a little bit more about um, like a dynamic or a transformative type styling, um, and, and the most common one right now is, is post CSS, which is really transforming styles with JavaScript. Um, it, it, the majority of the people that consume it, it they they use it kind of in the style of SAS or less, where it's, it's in, in many ways it's a preprocessor. And the JavaScript itself allows you to, to write polyfills for, for like experimental type technologies or things that are coming in, you know, in later versions of the CSS spec. But very much like SAS and very much like less, you've got to be very careful about the super selector Okay, so CSS is read from right to left. Okay, is everybody right? And so if you've got a selector that's this long, <laughs> right, and it's having to read those items, and, it's tr and, it, and that specificity is just really, I mean, and it's so easy when you're doing something like post CSS or something like less, where you've got this syntactic sugar that is like, oh yeah, I'm right and I'm super productive, right? But the compiled result are these just really crazy selectors, that's just gonna kill your performance. And then if you start to analyze the critical render path, it vastly complicates what that tree looks like, right? And so when it comes to the good practices of trying to maintain like single dimension selectors, I mean, when you actually start to really analyze that critical rendering, render path, you're gonna develop a real quick appreciation for the simple selector, okay? Um, Next thing I want to talk about, though, is uh, to kind of help mitigate some of these problems is CSS containment, which is a, an experimental uh, feature. It's been available in Chrome since version 52. And uh, basically what it allows you to do is isolate CSS down into uh, just, you know, an element and then all of its children. And any effects that you, let's say you used uh, you know, JavaScript to, to modify the DOM within this element, 
it's not going to trigger a redraw outside of that element. It's going to be contained within it. And uh, if you, uh, the, the reading here on this link down here at the bottom, the very first thing they show you is how, you know, by adding containment to an existing page, you're able to minimize redraws down to like fractions of a second, like, like milliseconds, right? And so it's, um, th those types of things I think are, are, are very important, uh, you know, especially when you feel productive with your CSS, you know, you know you're thinking, you know, you're rocking and rolling, but th that CSS can, can really kill your performance, right? And uh, those are the things that I, I, I recommend, uh, you know, just, just be weary of. Uh, next, I wanna talk a little bit more about web components and, and the, you know, essentially the future of, of performance and, and web management. Um, you know, components are gonna be these self-contained uh, building blocks you know, for all of the things. And I think that uh, it's important that you, you understand that you get these, you know, you can leverage all the latest technology, right? The HTML templates, right? Uh, the shadow DOM, which is absolutely fascinating. Um, the, you know, the custom elements and the imports. And you can consolidate it down into this bundled item that contains all of its JavaScript, all of its HTML, all of its CSS, and it's not affected by the outside, nor does it affect the outside elements. And so you can distribute these components in a way that uh, are reusable without affecting it. So it would be great if I, you know, especially if you're an agency that's doing like say web ads, you can build this completely self-contained ready to rock ad and you know that you won't hurt anybody's items, right? Or they can plant it on their site without any kind of effects, right? But you can leverage the HTML technology instead of having to bake an image or use Flash, which is, yeah, like a non-starter, so. Um, the other things that I think are really fascinating, especially when it comes to the shadow DOM, is the, the CSS scoping, which is very similar to, to containment, except that containment itself is, a, is an individual property versus actually taking like a block of, of CSS and scoping it to an element within an element. And so uh, it's, it's, it's real interesting to, when you actually get into the process of manufacturing web components, how it, you know, bundling it all and keeping things uh, relevant and scoped uh, can be extremely helpful. Um, ton of information out there um, uh, related to it. Uh, I, I believe that web components really are truly the, the, the future of the web, especially from, from a DA perspective. I think it's just a matter of time, uh, especially from a decoupled perspective, right? If you're just loading components in an assembled fashion, and then something like uh, like BigPipe, I mean, that's what it's really all about, right? It's just kind of like identifying the components that are cached versus the ones that aren't and really bringing them in in parallel. So, uh, DevTools for, for UI. Um, this is the, the timeline tab for, for Chrome, and I, I didn't get too much into it showing it here, but if you're gonna analyze, you wanna actually see your CSS object model and see how how CSS is being rendered or how it's being affected by scripting, this is really where it's all at and you can really identify exactly what's happening, when it's happening, and why it's happening. Um, for D.O, you can see that in this case, the, the CSS is, is pretty optimized, you know, uh, not much time spent loading. The render time and the paint time are virtually nothing, right? But that scripting, it's like half a second, right? And so, this, uh, this tool right here is really good and it's at your fingertips as you're developing, so it's one of those things that I would recommend just kind of, kind of using as you, as you move along. And in terms of D8 highlights for UI, there is a module right now that, uh, of, that, that does bring in components. I, I agree right here with this assertion that web com uh, components are the future, but uh, I haven't used this module and I am not responsible for anything that happens if you download it, okay? <laughs> Um, but it, it is out there and, and, and people are pretty serious about it and so I, I recommend you take a look and um, maybe we can get this under version 1.0 and get that, get this thing off there. Okay, Q&A for UI. Come on guys, just one, I'll take one. There we go. How do you feel about data URIs and the usage of them? Data URIs. Um, so that would be. Um, how do I feel about data URIs? That would so you're, that would be like um, data colon slash slash, right? Oh, 
I got you like a base, in, base 64 encoded in, but yeah. Um, so I'm a big fan of having that kind of stuff in line without actually making the second request, but I, th I think it needs to be um, used in a conservative manner so that you're not like have this super bloated file, right? Or um, even from a developer's perspective, if I'm like actually in, the, in my editor and it's, it's causing me to have to be able to scroll infinitely to the right, you know, it's just things like that. Um, but I, I think they make a lot of sense. And I, I think if you're really targeting something like mobile, um, it can be a very useful tool, definitely. Yes? Okay. <clears throat> I don't know if this will fall into a future section, but I uh, wondered what your opinion was uh, adopting uh, accelerated mobile pages. AMP. So um, do I, uh, 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 adopting AMP. Um, my personal website is done in AMP. I love it. I think Not it's side great. Not side by side, but the whole site is built. The, the, my, my personal whole site. But it's a, it's a flat site. It's not built in Drupal. Don't, don't judge me. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but, but AMP, uh, for, for those of you that aren't familiar, Accelerated Mobile Pages is a, is a, is a, a set of tags and a very opinionated uh, set of conventions for writing HTML that achieves maximum performance. And the coolest thing about it is that when you have a fully AMP compliant site, Google will cache your website for you on, you know, without you even knowing, and so you get instant load on search results. Another great thing that AMP does is if you're leveraging it, it actually will tell you what you're violating, right? Which is extremely helpful, because then you just have to follow instructions to make your website fast. I mean, it couldn't be any easier, right? Now, in terms of D8, there is an AMP setup, yes? That's my issue is adopting it where you kind of have like this two sets of content or at least two whole structures for markup at the same time. Well, so the D8 version uh, doesn't, to, to my knowledge as I've, as I've played with it, they actually are m like transforming your output in real time. And so you've got, you know, you're, you're just doing things normally and then they're actually rewriting your HTML on the fly on the way out. I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like... I don't like people changing something I said was one way and now it's another, right? Like, yeah, yeah. So that, that right there is, um, even writing a module like that in my mind is extremely bold, <laughs> okay? Yeah. Right, yeah, like, yeah, not, no, you, it really should be like this, <laughs> you know? Um, but uh, that's, that really kind of is pretty standard developer attitude, right? You know, so, uh, <laughs> so I'm not surprised, <laughs> you know, but, um, but I, I think that AMP ha is, is amazing. I, I went to AMP, the first AMP Conf in New York earlier this year, and um, you know, I, people were doing some really amazing things with it. Um, and then it's really adopting the web component model, and so you know, because of the custom elements, and so they're promoting a lot of the best of the web. And having Google back your techniques <laughs> is only a good thing. And so, yeah, okay. does that answer your question? Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you so much. This is about fonts. Sure. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm a big fan of icon fonts because I like being able to change the color of my icons on the fly. It's very simple stuff that I don't necessarily need a, an SVG for um, and that are um, visually just enhancements, that kind of thing, so that we're not going to need um, to account for them for screen readers, that kind of thing. Um, but with that, uh, you know, I'm I'm making my own in, in Icom Moon and loading it from my own uh, site. Uh, and then I have fonts that I need from Typekit. Um, and so that's external, and so I'm doing some fonts external, some internal. Um, and then, you know, there's the whole you can go and grab them yourself and, and load them with Google. What do you recommend when you're trying to do multiple sources for, for fonts? Um, pray. <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm just joking. I'm just kidding. Um, I, I, think, I think you're, prob you're pretty much on the right track. Uh, Typekit, they have, they're serious about fonts, obviously. So they're going to give you the best possible performance and experience, right? I mean, they're going to optimize it as much as possible so that you continue to use their service and and generate revenue. So I, I think you're pretty much on the right track. Um, you know, but just, uh, if anything, just try to be conservative, right? I mean, if you're yeah. going like five fonts, right. it's like, ugh, right? Uh, you know, but um, otherwise, I, I'd say that you're, you know, it's probably about as best as it's gonna get. And then as far as like when you load them, 
So I, I guess uh, in, in terms of uh, the discussion earlier, you would do your um, internal fonts first and then your typekit like way down the line. Um, I, I, would, I, would, I would recommend in that case, see th this is a good example of, of, um, of, no, of, of problem of like, you know, invisible um, issues where you're actually encouraging requests for fonts but that request is being um, obtained from a CSS file, so you may not even know that it's coming in, right? right. Um, I would leverage something like resource hints to try to say start downloading these in advance, right, because it is third party. Um, and then that way when that request comes in, it's, it, lo it sees that it's already in flight. But I would prioritize the external stuff as soon as possible just and, and leverage, leverage uh, some of the other techniques to try to get it get it up as high as possible. Cool, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah, you got it, thank you. This is just Don't one leave, guys, I'm sorry. Don't leave, no, no, I'm just kidding. I'm this is just one more horror story about fonts. Uh, I work for a large organization and our security people manage our browser settings and for IE, they've disabled downloadable fonts unless they fall within certain security zones. So most sites that are not our own sites don't on that security zone so they won't render properly. If they're coming in, if we're sitting at our desk downloading a site, they won't render correctly. In fact, when we add new sites to our own inventory, unless I think to add those specifically to a security zone, management will see these things and say, why aren't our new sites looking right? Gotcha. Unless they look at them on Chrome, and most of them all look at them on some version of IE. So something else to take into account when you're dealing with fonts. Absolutely, I think maybe maybe the, the 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 data URIs might actually help overcome some of that, um, but uh, yeah, yikes! Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, I just thought about this, and I haven't thought completely through it, but uh, and I'm not sure if this is proper practice or whatever. But in Drupal, typically there's scripts and um, style sheets put right in the theme uh, file there. So if you wanted to instead be doing some sort of prefetching on those maybe or even on a, a video file that might change in Drupal, is there an easy way to do that or is there a better way to have your sheets and scripts coming in that you're um, aware of? So like, like in the theme you're doing like, it's like Drupal add JS or something like that, right? Like are, are you talking about like version seven or version eight? Like seven. Seven, okay. So uh, are you talking about like a, like actually having um, like hooks starting to augment the, 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 the file set itself? Is that? Um, well in the theme file you know how you could like uh, lay out what scripts get pulled in? R right, sure, sure. Okay, I got you, uh, like with the actual like in the info file? Yeah. Yeah, oh. The well, file yeah, okay. itself. Yeah, all right, so, so this is actually really, a really good question. Um, so if you're including resources through the info file, don't do that. Don't, like, don't do that. You want to use, you actually want to attach it as like a library, and that way you can specify which group it's going into, whether it's going to be like the default group or the theme group, right? And that way you get better bundling when you actually activate aggregation. Otherwise, um, the aggregator is going to, is going to use groups and, and weights to determine how to aggregate. And half the time, if you just add them like that, they're just, it's just going to be another aggregate file. And so that, that, one's, that one's tricky. Yeah, 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 you got to play with that one um, a, a little bit more. But I, I, I would highly recommend that. Um, you know, uh, if there's like a tutorial out there somewhere? Um, there, there, um, there are some, some tutorials out there that talk specifically about how to optimize the aggregate because of these types of concerns, but um, I highly, really recommend reading the, um, just the theming guide, and it talks a little bit, it, the documentation is there, but it's just not necessarily front and center. But um, yeah, the, your, Drupal will make assumptions for you that may not result in the most performant option, yeah. So. Cool, thanks. Okay. Yeah, you got it, thank you. Okay. Uh, so I had a, almost like a comment on the, um, like kind of the, like, if you need a font from like Typekit as well as, as Google Fonts. And it's also a question if it's even the right way to go if you've ever tried it. So uh, Google or Typekit, can't remember which one has on GitHub like a web font.js um, thing where you, can, where you can kind of pass it an object with, you know, the, the Typekit key and then, the, and then the Google Fonts, yeah. Yeah. If you're doing both. 
that's what I use as well. But I don't know. Have you heard of it? Is it? Um, you know, have you, you know, have I you haven't. Um, I haven't heard of that. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think it's compelling. I, can, can we talk about that a little bit more offline? Is that is that is that fair? Let's do it. Cool. Especially because I think uh, now that everybody's leaving, that, that means that uh, I'm actually almost at time. Um, so thank you all for staying. Um, but uh, uh, one more question. Let's go ahead and let's go for it. Okay. My question's about moving to HTTP two, uh -huh. and um, so. HTTP 1 setup, we have domain sharding, we're using CloudFront as a CDN, all that caching. What's, what, what's, do you know of any gotchas when you go to HTTP 2? Should we, you know, I, I hear that's not what you're supposed to be using, you know, domain, like domain sharding and. Um, the, the only real big gotchas are more that um, some of the, the optimization that you do in HTTP 1, like, like concatenating files together, is actually kind of like an anti-pattern in HTTP2 because it's, it's better to leverage that multiplex connection to just download everything in parallel. And so th 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 there's little gotchas like that and they're documented out there, but um, for the most part it's pretty transparent and then you get the header compression. And so it's, it, it can only really be better. Cool. Yeah, you got it. Um, you. So uh, the next thing we were supposed to talk about was, was code, but I think everybody wants to figure out where the next con's gonna be. <laughs> and I know that everybody would like to have at least a decent seat. So I'm going to cruise through real quick because there's one thing I really want to talk about. Um, first, I, I, want to, I want to talk a little bit about performance, uh, just some th brief thoughts. You know, you've got low performance and you've got high performance, okay? And, um, you know, performance does challenge you. It, it, it will make you get out of your comfort zone because, you, you know, you have to learn more about the tech. I mean, you know, you could have the simple shovel or you could have the bulldozer or, or the backhoe, but the backhoe requires you to know about engineering, metallurgy, hydraulics, okay? I mean, you know, everything other than digging a hole, okay? <laughs> right? It challenges you and it's, and it's important to get out of your comfort zone if you really want to get to the, the side of performance. Uh, next, performance frustrates. Because you, a lot of times, you know, you're, you're doing all this work towards performance, but you're not actually getting any better performance, right? And so just stick with it. I just want to say that, you know, hang in there because a lot of times progress comes slow. Next, performance is rewarding. It validates everything. It means that you really know your, your criteria. You've got a measurement that proves that you've achieved a certain performance. Everybody's happy with it. And so um, one more thing. Texas camp is in a month. I highly recommend if you guys can go, please, we'd love to have you. It's going to be really fun. Uh, yeah, yes. And uh, if you want to put in a, pro, a, a talk, you've got until tomorrow. So, sorry for the short notice. Um, and that's, uh, that's really about it. Thank you.